Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for being here and for even inviting me to give this uh, presentation. Um, this is a, a conference on human capital and growth, and so I'm going to start by saying that uh, health, and good health in particular, um, is a critical economic asset, especially in low-income countries where people tend to work for their own. So if they are sick one day and cannot go to work, that means no earning that day. Um, but also, um, they are often in occupation that require strong physical health. And so being weak also means being less productive. But even if all of this was not the case, maybe health uh, would be a good thing to study in any case, because just being healthier means living a fuller life. Um, and so even if health was not uh, important in the production function and not a, an input into growth, we would still want to care about it. Um, and the issue here is that good health is yet um, uh, is, is still very much lacking in many lower income countries. There's definitely been progress um, towards uh, what used to be the Millennium Development Goals, um, which were not fully achieved by 2015. Um, and so there's still today six to seven million children uh, that die every year be before the age of five, uh, most of them in Sub-Saharan Africa. And what I want to highlight today is the fact that up to two thirds of these deaths, as per some estimates, uh, could be averted using existing health products. So by that I mean vaccines, anti-malarial anti bed nets, water chlorination, water filters, things like that. So the key question is how to increase adoption of these products um, so that uh, children don't die uh, and, and um, older individuals uh, don't uh, lose on productivity. So if you ask you know, parents of these children uh, what, what the problem is, they tell you that they don't have money to buy them. So an obvious solution then is to subsidize these products. And um, standard theory gives us a number of uh, reasons to do that. The first one is that many of the diseases we're talking about are communicable, <laughs> which means that limiting uh, their spread is a public good. So that justifies um, Peruvian subsidies. And on top of that, um, you can think of it from a dynamic standpoint. Subsidizing may more than pay off for themselves if they enable people to become uh, healthier and more productive, and later on in their life, they will pay back in taxes uh, more than the, how much it costs to help them uh, become productive when they were yo younger in their lifetime. So the question is whether this solution can work. So for the hope for impacts of subsidies to be realized, we need a number of things to hold. Um, first, beneficiaries of the subsidized inputs have to put them to appropriate use. Um, and so, you know, for things like vaccines, it's obviously uh, the case because once you've been given antibodies into your bloodstream, there is not much you can do to take them out. And so the health impacts will be there, whether you want it or not. For many other things that require that people on a daily basis uh, take um, an action, uh, this may not be as obvious. Okay, so we take it for granted that we can just turn on the tap and fill out water glass and drink it and be safe, but in many parts of the world that's not the case. You have to you know, fetch water every day and then you have to put in some chlorine uh, after you fetch the water. Um, for you know, bed nets, you have to like, tie it over your bed every night and things like that. And so it requires some proactive behavior on the part of subsidy recipients. And then a, a third issue is that um, you know, if, if, we, uh, if we subsidize too much, maybe the beneficiaries are not going to be putting forth this effort because if they've not shown that they are willing to pay a little bit in terms of money in, our, in order to get these products, maybe that means they won't be willing to pay in time or, or, or attention to use them properly. So that's the first condition for these uh, subsidies to lead to the health impacts you would hope for. The second condition is that subsidies have to reach the internet beneficiaries in the first place. And here we, talking, we are talking of governments concerned, um, maybe the incentives that the health workers uh, face uh, mean that subsidized inputs will be left to rot in the storage room or they will be stolen uh, along the way. This is just um, a picture I took in Uganda, um, uh, highlighting uh, individuals there to the fact that um, they have rights to quality health care, um, and they shouldn't listen to doctors uh, trying to send them off uh, to their private clinic instead of giving them uh, the public uh, care they are entitled to. So if this posture is um, 
a good representation of, of the incentives of the health workers, maybe relying on them to implement these subsidy schemes will mean that they won't reach the people uh, that need these subsidies. So what I want to talk about today uh, is share with you some evidence from uh, mostly my own work. It's a little bit of a self-serving talk uh, on these issues. Um, looking both at the demand side and the supply side. And so on the demand side, the question is going to be, how can we design subsidies so as to balance access and targeting to those we will use inputs, okay? And on the supply side, um, how serious a concern or governance issues in the delivery uh, of subsidies for essential health products. So starting with the demand side, uh, I just want to put uh, a very uh, simple, uh, uh, you know, problem for what I call the principle here, which is going to be the social planner or the government thinking of a subsidy scheme, okay? So you can think of uh, the principle valuing the health benefits of a health product as well as a non-health utility uh, of potential recipients and alternative uses of funds, okay? And so you want to maximize the sum uh, of this uh, um, uh, individual utilities minus the cost of fund plus the contribution value, and the individual utilities are a function of um, what is the extra, um, um, you know, monetary value you get out of getting people healthier. So that's going to be a function of, you know, BI, which is the daily value of total health benefit when individual I uses these health products appropriately, uh, the one that you're thinking of subsidizing. Z, uh, DALI, is a dollar value of the DALI to the principles. It's just a way to, to monetize you know, the health gains here. And HI is a binary variable uh, indicating whether I use the product appropriately. Okay? So BI times Z DALI is at times HI tells me um, the essentially gains to having uh, individual I use a product. UI is I's uh, uh, non-health utility. Okay? And then obviously there's a cost to subsidizing the program. Let's say it costs me a total of S. Um, what matters for this cost is what is the marginal cost of public funds. Okay, so how, what is the, the cost of raising this, um, uh, this money through taxation, for example. Okay, so why do I put this here? Because when you have this, you can immediately see that the benefit to increasing marginally the subsidy uh, by an amount DS is gonna be uh, exceeding the cost of this subsidy if the following equation holds. And so in particular, what I want you to pay attention to is the fact that on the left-hand side, you're looking at the effect of increasing the number of people who are now covered uh, by this health product, okay? So that's gonna be a function of the proportion of people that are induced to use thanks to this policy change. So you, ch you, re you, you increase the subsidy, you change the, the price, um, you know, you lower the price, that's gonna induce a bunch of people to start now, uh, you know, acquiring the product um, and, and potentially um, using it. What matters for the health impact is the share of those that use it. So use more is really the proportion induced to use by the policy change. And then for those, the value uh, of this change in their behavior is again, this Z daddy times now B uh, ma the, the marginal the sorry the health benefit among those induced to use uh, by the policy change. So these are the marginals who are affected by the policy. Okay, and then on the other side, what matters for the cost is not who uses, is who actually takes it. Okay, and so on the right hand side, what you have is a share of people who are induced to take the product by the policy. So what I call take ma for take marginal. For each person who is induced to take the product thanks to the subsidy. Uh, that costs me now the entire subsidy amount, which is S. And then on top of that, I now have to pay the extra subsidy for all of the infra marginals. So the take F, these are all those that were already taking the product when it was subsidized less. Now they still take it, but I have to subsidize them more. So it costs me an extra take F times DS. Okay, all of this uh, times the value uh, of funds lambda. Okay, so this equation is now gonna help us think through the potential trade-offs that you face when you think about subsidizing more or less. Okay, so I'm writing it again at the top here. Um, and the first um, trade-off that you can see that if the share of people in use to use the product by the subsidy is smaller than the share of people in use to take it, okay, it means that the subsidy policy induces some people to take the input, but they end up not using it appropriately, okay? 
So you have a wedge between the number of people that you subsidize and the number of people that actually use the product. So that's, you can think of it as wastage in a way because you, you finance um, this, but you don't get as much health impact as you were uh, hoping to. The second issue is if the benefits for these marginal uh, users is actually low. So if, as you reduce the price, those who are enticed to take it because of the lower price have lower and lower returns, because that's why they were not willing to pay much in the first place, then uh, you know, the further you decrease the price and the further you increase the subsidy, the lower and the lower the, the, the health benefits that you get out of that, okay? Um, and finally, if you have a lot of inframarginals to start with, then the cost of, of increasing the subsidy um, is, is gonna be um, uh, high because of that, okay? So these are uh, essentially the, the main thing that you wanna think about. Um, and so, you know, when you uh, increase the price, you, you know, in theory, you are, you know, or rather the less you increase the subsidy in theory, uh, the less of an issue these things are going to be, but then obviously it means that access may be uh, considerably reduced. And so you have this trade-off between increasing access uh, and keeping your targeting relatively um, you know, good so that you don't have all of these low returns folks uh, getting the subsidy. So ultimately, the relative importance of, of these problems is an empirical question. It's gonna be context specific, okay? So I'm gonna share with you some evidence from some context where I have looked at these uh, questions, but by no means does it you know, generate, uh, 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 you know, um, kind of like general statements about uh, what should be the optimal subsidy level in general, okay? It really depends uh, on the product, on the, on the demand function for it, uh, and on all of the parameters that I have here, which, which are gonna vary uh, across areas, um, but, uh, it's good to have a sense of the extent to which there's a range of possibilities um, and think of various uh, cases where one or the other uh, of the policy options works better to try to get a sense of uh, what are the underlying features of the demand uh, that can help us guess ex ante what would be better or worse in a given situation, okay? So first, to try to look at the first um, uh, question of the, the gap, the wedge between you know, the usage rate among marginals and, and the, uh, the take-up rate. Um, the question is, you know, do marginal takers use the subsidized inputs? So I'm gonna share results for four, uh, from four studies. Um, the first two look at um, uh, anti-malarial bed nets. Both of these studies were done uh, in Kenya, the first one with Jessica Cohen was done with pregnant women. The second uh, one was done with just representative households. Um, and what you can see on these graphs, uh, they both have a blue line and a green line. What the um, blue line shows is the share of households that acquired uh, the product, this bed net, uh, at different price points. And what the green line shows is the share of people that are uh, acquire the product and are using it along different price points, okay? So the blue line uh, gives you a sense of this, uh, the share of takers, um, and the green line, the share of users, okay? So this was done by randomizing the price at which people could acquire the product. So in the top study, this was done at clinics, some uh, prenatal clinics were randomized into um, giving bed nets for free or they were randomized into charging 10 Kenyan shillings for a bed net. This is a very heavy subsidy uh, for this bed net that cost, uh, you know, when unsubsidized, something like 500 Kenyan shillings in local currency, or at the time, something like eight or nine dollars. Um, so 10 shillings is a very, very small share of the full price, which, we, which is 500. Um, and then the, the, some clinics were randomized into charging 20 shillings and some 40 shillings. It didn't go further than that because all clinics were already selling bed nets for a price of 50 shillings. They were subsidized by, the, by an, um, uh, an international uh, NGO called PSI. Uh, and so already they were available for 50 shillings. Okay, so we just further decreased the price um, slowly across uh, clinics uh, all the way down to zero in some of them. So because of the randomization uh, ac you know, across clinics, uh, we can uh, look at these differences in take-up rates across 
groups as evidence of the causal impact of the price on take up. So this is essentially showing you the demand curve, uh, which is properly estimated and is not a uh, willingness to, uh, it's not stated willingness to pay, it's revealed, um, you know, uh, ability to pay. These are the share of pregnant women who bought uh, the bed net. And as you can see from the blue line, um, when it's free, pretty much everybody takes one home. When it's 10 shillings, almost everyone is able to, 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 to pay that. And as the price goes up a bit, uh, it starts going down. And when the price is 40 shillings, which is not that uh, high in absolute term compared to the value of the product, it is uh, remarkably low, uh, just about 40% of people taking. Okay? In the second study, um, households had three months to redeem a voucher um, so they had time to save. So there the prices were also varied randomly, this time across households, um, and the price range was much larger. It went all the way to 250 shillings, which was a 50% subsidy. Because people had three months to save and redeem the voucher, the take-up rate is actually higher. So even at the 40 shilling price point from the study above, now the take-up rate is above um, 60%, okay? So as people have time to accumulate um, money, they, they are better able to purchase these things. But still, what you can see from the blue line on the second graph um, is that demand still drops down uh, relatively quickly as the price goes up, okay? So this shows that, you know, um, Econ 101 is right. You know? <laughs> um, as the price goes up, demand goes down. Yeah. Uh, but what's interesting here in these graphs is comparing the blue line with the green line. The green line tells you uh, not just who, is, who has it, but also who is using it, okay? Um, so this is essentially taking the blue line uh, and multiplying it by the usage rate among those who acquire the product, okay? And um, what you can see for the most part is that this, this are, there's not a very big, uh, uh, the, like the, the share um, of the takers who seem to be using it uh, is quite uh, similar across price groups with a little bit of uh, variation, but overall, um, if we look at the usage rate condition of having the product, it's pretty much flat and independent of, uh, of the price. Um, and what this suggests is that by the, the, the few people who self-select into buying a, at a very high price don't actually end up having a higher usage rate uh, than those who only take it when it's free. Um, the other way around, which is a um, better way to think about it in this context, is that those who only get it when it's free or very cheap are as likely to use it uh, the, as those um, that uh, had to, you know, self-selected into paying for it, okay? And this is, you know, essentially because um, everybody uses a bed net appropriately when they get one. Not in immediately, so in the top graph, you can see this gap, it's only about 60% of bed net recipients who seem to be using it within two months of getting it. Uh, but in the survey, we asked them whether they still had it, and we could verify whether they had the bed nets. And indeed, 99% of people had, you know, could show us physically the bed net that kept it very nicely uh, packed if they were not yet using it. And you know, they had a good reason uh, for not using it yet. They said some of them said, "I'm waiting for my baby to be born," um, which you know is not actually a very good reason because they should uh, product themselves while they're pregnant. So we told them that. Um, which is why we didn't do a long-term follow-up because we kind of like uh, meddled with, uh, um, you know, we, we gave them information out of a sense of, uh, uh, you know, ethical obligation at the time of the survey. Uh, but in this, the study in the bottom part of the graph, we did do a one-year follow-up. Uh, we, did, we did a two-month follow-up and then also a one-year follow-up. And then the two-month follow-up, we also had about 60% usage rate. Uh, but in a one-year follow-up, it was much higher, at around 90%. Okay, so within one year, everybody was putting the product uh, to good use. So that's the case where everyone who gets one uses it. So through screening uh, with prices, you don't really get the benefit of screening people who are going to have a higher usage rate. You just have the downside of screening out people who can't pay. Okay? So these are the first two studies, um, but it's not always like that. So in the case of uh, water purification product, uh, we have this study uh, where um, we, again, randomized across individuals whether they had to uh, pay 10 shillings, uh, which is a 50% subsidy, 20 shillings, the food price, or whether they would get a free uh, uh, one-year supply of uh, chlorine, that's a water purification product. 
Uh, and there we find that uh, many of the marginal takers don't use. Okay, so if you drop chlorine onto people's laps at their house, you know, they take it because they feel a bit bad saying, no, no, I'm not, you know, I'm, I, I don't want it. But then uh, many of them don't use it. Okay, so this is a case where um, if you give it for free to uh, many people, you get a 100% take up, but only about a 38% usage rate, okay? So in that case, you say, well, let's charge a price. So you, if you bring the price to 10 shillings, which is um, this 50% subsidy, you actually reduce the share of people who are now using um, by, you know, by, by, by half, okay? So you are getting a much better targeting in the sense that only people who are gonna use do they take it? So the blue and the green line now are like exactly on top of each other at this 10 shillings price point. But this comes at a heavy cost in terms of exclusion errors because you have about, you know, um, something like 20% of people who would be using it if they could afford it now not using it. Okay, so depending on how you value, you know, the health uh, and, and the survival of the children whose parents are excluded from this, you may think that, okay, it's a little bit too harsh. Um, to, to charge this price and then lose out on so many people. Uh, but the question is how can you get them back in without wasting a whole bunch of money subsidizing 60% of people who are not gonna take it anyway, okay? So uh, we're gonna come back to that uh, later to think of ways, um, alternative ways to screen. Um, and so we have you know, some, some other uh, type of subsidy in that top study, study number three, um, that, that we'll come, come, come to in a minute. Before that, I wanted to show another case uh, where um, we find that marginal takers are, you know, uh, marginal users. This is a case of antimalarial treatment. Um, we are looking at uh, the likelihood that people who bought an antimalarial uh, at a subsidized price actually took it uh, at the time um, for that same disease for which they got it. And this is comparing you know, administrative data on who bought the drug and endline data on who reported taking it. We find a very uh, clear alignment between the two, okay? So we find that for bed net and for multimodal treatment, there is not much of a wedge between marginal takers and marginal users, but for chlorine there is definitely one. Now the second question is whether marginal users have lower returns, okay? Um, and so here what we can do, we can take the same set of four studies and look at the characteristics of the people who self-select into paying more. Maybe, you know, everybody uses the Bennett at the same rate, uh, but those who are not willing to pay for it actually don't get as much benefit from using it because they face a much nicer environment or something like that. So to check whether that's the case, we can look here at whether the rate of anemia at baseline is different, okay? And we see maybe a little bit of a, of a gradient there, but you can, I don't know if you can see the confidence intervals, but we can't reject that essentially they are the same. Uh, anemia is one of the factors we can look at. We can look at other uh, characteristics of the household. And on the whole, you know, there's not a much clear evidence that those who self-select into paying a higher price are those who are gonna have higher returns based on, on their underlying health characteristics or environment. If anything, in the bottom study, uh, this time we can, we can look at whether those who are self-selecting into buying um, at a higher price, uh, we are less likely to be protected to start with, and we find, if anything, is the other way around. They are more likely to already have a bed net. Um, essentially, they are richer that's why they can afford to pay the higher price, okay? So doesn't seem, so, so the price doesn't seem to be a very good mechanism to identify those who are gonna have higher returns. Um, same for study number three, now we can look at the rate of diarrhea among children at baseline and see whether it's those who self-select into buying at 10 or 20 shillings, and the few of those who do, whether they have uh, a higher rate of diarrhea, and again, it's, you know, you know, overall, there's a lot of diarrhea going on. That's the sad news. Um, and it doesn't seem to be much differential across types uh, of households. Um, so again, here, we don't see much of a, um, differences in likely marginal returns uh, across, uh, across uh, willingness to pay groups. But in the fourth study now, we see something very different. So in the fourth study, 
where we look at um, the pricing for malaria treatment, we, we can look at the likelihood that you actually have malaria. Okay? So we know that you bought an ACT, uh, artemisinin commission therapy, uh, we know that you took it, and we also know whether you had malaria or not, because we posted uh, enumerators who, after people had bought the drug, would say, hey, excuse me, can I test you uh, for malaria for you know, a, a, a random subset of individuals. And so we actually know uh, the true malaria status of people, um, and we find that it's actually not that high. <laughs> uh, it's less than 60% at the uh, higher subsidy level, so we, we didn't have a free group here, the, the, short, the smallest price um, was a 92% subsidy, and then the subsidy increases, um, sorry, decreases to 88% and then 80%, and we find that as you decrease the subsidy level, you seem to be considerably increasing the share of people uh, who actually have malaria. So this is a case where by decreasing the level of the subsidy, you improve the targeting, okay? Uh, and so, you know, the question is how, how come um, if people have information, uh, good information about their uh, malaria status, why are they uh, still uh, you know, interested in taking anti-malaria when they know they don't have malaria because there's actually no advantage of doing that. There's not even an anti effect of taking anti-malaria if you don't have malaria. Um, and so here what seems to be going on is actually not that people know uh, their malaria status or have any information about their underlying malaria status. It's just that the, the, the prices um, that we had in our experiment were such that as we move from 92% to 88%, um, it's meant that the, the relative price change, sorry, the absolute price change for an adult dose was much bigger than for a child dose. Okay, so when you reduce the subsidy, uh, even if it's only four percentage points, maybe it doesn't look that much. But for an adult dose, which has a higher you know, uh, absolute value of the price, that corresponds to a higher absolute Kenyan shilling change. And that made a whole bunch of households unable to now afford the adult dose, but they could still afford the child dose, which is much cheaper because you need fewer pills for the children. And so what seems to be going on is that as you change the price range, uh, the share of the you know, ACTs that are bought, uh, the, the share of the subsidy vouchers that are used to buy an infant or a child dose is much higher now. And because children are much more likely to have HIV conditional than having a fever, that's what gives you um, this, this apparent targeting. So it's kind of like you get that thanks to a, ch a, a lower subsidy, you get better targeting, but it's not because you force people to self-select based on information they have. It's more, here it was almost like a mechanical thing due to, to the specific price structure that we had. It was almost like, it took us a while to really understand what was going on. And then um, we realized that, you know, the, the, if we look at the price of other anti-malayals, um, for the adults, it turns out that as, you know, our cheapest uh, price was just below um, uh, uh, you know, a, a whole bunch of uh, other anti malarials but as soon as we increase the price, you know, it would become really dominated compared to other malarials in terms of uh, anti malarials in terms of price. Whereas for kids, our subsidy level uh, was such that the price remained um, always uh, cheaper for that anti malarial than any other. Okay, so it's a case where uh, it was a little bit disappointing for us initially because we thought, oh, right, there is private information, and you can exploit that and use price as a screening mechanism, turns out it's not really the story behind this, okay? But this means that when you think of uh, pricing, you want to actually keep in the back of your mind that you know, if people have a choice, they're gonna possibly have a you know, cheapest uh, option uh, type of uh, strategy, where they're gonna go for the cheapest drug out there. So you wanna think of the price that you charge also uh, keeping that in mind, that your, your, your people have a, have a basket of goods that they can choose from, okay? And so sometimes you can use that to get at some, some targeting. Um, okay, so uh, these are evidence from studies I've been involved in, but in most of our existing studies to date, um, price also appears uh, to be a poor targeting tool. So, uh, you know, there are many other 
studies out there now that suggest that marginal takers do not seem to have lower usage or lower returns uh, than, than, than people who, who, don't, uh, who, who are uh, able to pay. Um, so this was found in the case of uh, deworming, uh, that uh, <coughs> charging people for deworming medication does not help target the deworming drugs to those who are more likely to need deworming. Um, those with higher willingness to pay for water filters in Ghana don't see greater drops in diarrhea incidence from using the filter. That's a study by Barry Fisher and Guitaras. Um, same with flip-flops in Kenya. You may wonder why flip-flops uh, is considered a health product. Well, it's because of worms. If you actually do not wear shoes, uh, you can get worm, uh, in, in, infected by worms much more easily um, from the soil. If you wear uh, any form of shoes, you're better off. Flip-flops are just the cheapest one. Um, Soap and vitamins in Uganda, Guatemala, and India, there is a study by Meredith et al. finding uh, evidence uh, that um, price, uh, again, matters a lot for the demand, but doesn't really help much with targeting. The one study where there is evidence of some effects of uh, some selection mechanisms through price uh, that goes along some form of targeting based on immediate usage is a study by Ashraf Bear and Shapiro uh, in Zambia. Uh, but here they find again that you know by charging prices you select people who are uh, richer, uh, not people who have a higher underlying health burden. Okay. But that said, you know in the case of the chlorine, they find some evidence of screening on prices. Uh, we do find a lot in, in the study uh, with Hoffman, Kramer, and Zwayne, we do see a lot of free recipients not using. And so the question is, you know, in such cases, uh, how do you do? Uh, to improve targeting. Price is not a good screening mechanism because too few people can afford to pay. But on the other hand, we do get a whole bunch of inclusion errors in some cases like chlorine. Okay? So is there anything we can do in such situation? Um, and so we are going to now think about something that is a non-monetary screening mechanism. And very elegantly, uh, economists decided to call it an ordeal. <laughs> Um, so can we use an ordeal mechanism instead of a price uh, mechanism uh, to help screen non-users, okay? And so uh, this is something that was first theorized by Nichols and Zeghauser um, and is now being used in some cases. I mean, you can think of certain types of benefits requiring people to go through an ordeal. To redeem a food stamp in the U.S., you have to go to a, you know, food, you know, a store and show your food stamp card and... Uh, that can be an ordeal because it's a humiliating thing to do. Uh, in India, to access um, this uh, essentially uh, minimum uh, income, you have to work uh, at public work sites through the National Rural Employment Guarantee uh, Scheme, which is you know, a form of you having to do some effort in order to get um, the benefits. In principle, you know, the National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme is a way to make the ordeal not be a pure dead weight loss, because actually something is being produced out of people having to go through the ordeal. Uh, in, in many cases, the ordeal is a pure dead weight loss. You just make people jump through hoops in order to get the stuff, but there is no productive aspect of whatever they are doing. Okay? Um, and what's tricky in ordeal mechanisms is that the more attractive the benefit, um, the greater the ordeal must typically be, uh, to screen out those who are not going to put the product to, to proper use, okay? Um, so that may impose a really significant welfare cost, okay? But for many preventative health products like chlorine, uh, the benefit to non-health users is actually quite small, so maybe we don't need that big of an ordeal to deter people from taking the free stuff if they are not going to put it to use, okay? Um, so the way to add this in the framework I showed before is to say, well, now, you know, when you have this ordeal mechanism to allocate the product, you increase, you, you, you reduce the, the non-health utility of the marginal, um, you know, uh, takers, because now um, for them to be able to take it, they have to, to pay this ordeal cost, okay? So actually there should be... Uh, DU mar should be the change in non-health utility to new takers, not new users. So it should be uh, so. But so that this extra term DU mar, which is ne a negative thing, okay, I'm, I'm, my utility goes down from having to do this, uh, go through this ordeal. Um, and then for all the inframarginals, we were already uh, getting the product. Now they have to go through the hoop as well. Okay, and so you're increasing their non-health utility by having them 
pay this ordeal cost in order to uh, to get the thing that they were getting in the first place. Okay, and so the question is: Is it do, do the targeting benefits of that outweigh this cost? Okay, um, and this is gonna you know you have some chance uh, of this whole deal uh, being useful only if there is heterogeneity uh, in the relative cost of effort and money. So, for example, due to different wage levels, uh, so it could be you know the poor. Uh, you know, don't have money to buy these things, maybe they have plenty of time on their hand uh, because they are poor because they are unemployed or something like that. Um, and uh, it's really the joint distribution of this, uh, you know, uh, relative cost of effort and money and willingness to use that are going to be determining the extent to which you want to screen through price or an ordeal. Okay. So in the chlorine study that I mentioned earlier, study number three, we actually had one extra um, group beside the free and 10 shillings uh, that I showed on the graph earlier, we had um, an extra uh, group which was 100% subsidy, so it was free, but you had to go through some hoops to get the free stuff. It was one year supply like in the other free group, but this time you had to get it by going monthly to a shop to redeem a voucher. And when you got 12 vouchers, they were numbered, they were one, two, three, uh, blah, 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 to 12. On, in January, you'd have to redeem voucher number one, and in uh, August, voucher number eight, otherwise it would not work yet, to keep them uh, uh, well organized uh, and not lose them. The average distance to the shop where they could redeem uh, was uh, about uh, four kilometers. Uh, for some participants, it was the, the shop was in the nearest market, so to the extent that they go to the market anyway, that would be a relatively smaller ordeal than for those who would not go there anyway, okay? Um, and so we can compare free distribution, free, free through this, we call it a, sorry, we call it a micro ordeal because um, it doesn't seem like such a big ordeal to have to go to a shop to redeem the voucher. So we, we call it a micro ordeal. Uh, and we compare that with this free delivery where we just dropped uh, a one year supply onto people first when they came to the clinic, which is also where uh, the other women get, got the vouchers. We would give them six months worth uh, in the forms of a, a big bottle that they could take home. And then we went back to the house and gave them another uh, big bottle uh, after six months. And so this is the co coupon redemption over time. You can see that the first coupon everybody is excited about, uh, we get over 70% redemption. But then as soon as you get uh, to the second month, it goes down uh, to less than 50% and then it plateaus uh, between 40 and 50% for, for a while. Then it stops tapering off as you know things happen. Uh, in people's life, and maybe they forget about it, okay? Um, but so what this shows is that, you know, very quickly, maybe the first coupon, everybody wants to try it out, and, and then they realize chlorine is not for them. Uh, it gives some, it leaves some taste to the water. Uh, you know, it's maybe, it's, it's hard to figure out how to dose. Maybe the instructions say you have to put one cup, one cup, well, no, one cup full for, you know, a 40 liter thing, and your container, you don't exactly know its capacity because it's some, um, you know, uh, clay jar and you have no idea and you feel like you're doing it wrong, it stresses you out so you decide not to do it anymore. You learn that after one coupon and then you stop redeeming, okay? Um, and so what we find is that this coupon micro ordeal reduces inclusion error without increasing exclusion error. So if we look at the likelihood that you actually have chlorine in your water, I told you that in a free delivery group earlier, I showed you it was only 38%, even though 100% of people had taken the free stuff, with the coupon micro deal, we have the exact same share of people who have chlorine in their water at the follow-up, 38%, okay? So essentially, you don't lose anyone who would be using, but you just lose all of the people who are not gonna be using, okay? So this is a way to actually target precisely uh, the users, okay? Um, then you can say, well, is it really the same people? Okay, that uh, that you get with a coupon, and so we can't really say we don't we don't know that for a fact because we don't we have no one who was in, in in both treatments. It was you were in one or the other. It was randomized, but we can look at whether the diuretic at baseline is different across groups, and we don't find any difference. Okay, um, so compared to the earlier graph, I just added the free coupon group, and you can see that in this case it seems to be a great way to target. Okay. Um, so, you know, obviously what's tricky here is that the size of the ordeal is, is really uh, something that the, you can choose and it can be hard to, to choose it right. We were very lucky in this case, that we just somehow get it exactly right out of sheer luck, okay? Um, 
but you know, we, we can exploit variation in our data in, in how close you were uh, from the shop where you had to redeem the thing. In particular, if you could redeem the coupon at the nearest market, we find a higher redemption rate uh, of the coupon um, than if you were uh, uh, not close to the market. Uh, but then, we, so, so if, if you could redeem at the nearest market, the ordeal is less. As a result, there is a bigger gap between having chlorine in your water and having redeemed the coupon than if you are not uh, near the market. Okay, but then if you for people who are, for whom the ordeal is bigger, now there is fewer people with chlorine in their water. So you lose four percentage points. I'm sorry, I'm far from the thing, but you see, from 37 to 33, you lose four percentage points of people who would have used the product that it been, uh, you know, easier to redeem the voucher. And so then you have to trade off losing these four percent, four percentage points of households, with you know getting more people getting the coupons redeemed even though they're not going to use. Okay, and so how you trade that off is really a function of how you care about stuff. Okay, and so what we can do uh, with this is we can calibrate the model with assumptions on the health impact of water treatment, the cost of the policy, and a whole bunch of things, and identify regions of the parameter space for which a, a given policy is preferred. And we find for really the most plausible ranges of uh, you know, uh, your evaluation of a DALI uh, and for you know, the ordeal cost uh, size that we, we, we have in this case, using a 100% subsidy with a micro ordeal is vastly preferred to either free delivery or only a 50% subsidy. Okay, so adding this type of you know, subsidy uh, scheme really imp vastly increases um, the likelihood that you want to use it, actually. Uh, so this is just saying that as long as you value uh, a DALI saved uh, at, um, at, um, at least, you know, uh, it's even less than, like, $200, <laughs> uh, you're going to want to do the 100% stability with a micro ordeal uh, unless the cost of the ordeal is really high, okay? So... I'm not doing well on time, so I'm going to try to speed up. Um, you know, the, the, the relevance of this type of mechanism really depends on the characteristics of the product. Okay, so uh, if the incidence of non-health use is very low, then an, an ordeal is not a, like that is not a good idea. So in the case of the bed net study with household that I mentioned before, study number two, actually people had to redeem a voucher or a coupon in order to get the subsidy. Okay, so there was implicitly an ordeal in there. But everybody, if I gave people a free a coupon for a free bed net, everybody redeemed it, okay? So there, you know, everybody redeemed the coupon because everybody's gonna use it if they, if they get the product. So why have people go through an ordeal for that? that, that that's a pure, uh, you know, dead well off. So you don't need to do that. Uh, alternatively, the private returns to inappropriate use are very high. Again, you know, the ordeal is not gonna help. So in the case of the anti malarial treatment, I showed you a whole bunch of people redeem a coupon for a cheap anti-malaria, and then they take it, even though many of them don't have malaria. In fact, among adults, we find that only, you know, 40% of adults who take an anti-malaria have malaria, okay? Uh, and th they did go to the store to redeem a voucher for that, so they paid the whole deal cost to do that. So the problem here is that the value of presumptive treatment is extremely high. So even if you think the likelihood that you have malaria is only 10%, you want to get treated. If I told you you have a 10% chance of having malaria, you want the pill, I'm sure all of you would be like, yes. Okay. Um, so it's because there is a lack of access to reliable diagnostic tests that you know, people are in this situation that the option value of taking the treatment, even if you have a low chance of having the disease, is extremely high. So there the ordeal doesn't help. Okay, what you need instead is better diagnostic tests. And sometimes the ordeal can be too costly uh, because of the nature of the products. Okay, so I have an example where we give people vouchers for condoms. Absolutely nobody wanted to go redeem a voucher for free condoms at a local store uh, because the local store is manned by, you know, grandma or, you know, the, you know, uh, friend of my father and I just don't want to, you know, people in the community to know that I'm interested in condoms. So here we find very low redemption rate of vouchers for condoms, especially for adolescent girls. But the same type of individuals, if we go to their house, when the parents are not around and drop 150 condoms on them, uh, and yes, I've done that. Uh, here we find that, you know, many people actually take them 
Uh, not, you know, for girls, it's a bit hard to take 150 condoms at once and have a place where to hide them from their parents. So only half of them actually took all 150, but almost all of them took at least some, okay? So here, you know, something that you could think is a micro ordeal of just going to the store to redeem a voucher can be a macro ordeal because of the social, uh, the, you know, the, yeah, the, the, the social um, uh, capital implications of that, okay? So very quickly, uh, in the last five minutes, I'll talk about the other question uh, on the supply side, uh, the delivery side. Let's say you know, you've identified a product for which a given subsidy scheme, be it free distribution, if it's wet nets, or this voucher, uh, you know, coupons, uh, monthly coupons for chlorine uh, is a good idea. How do you want to implement that in practice? The most obvious way is to rely on the existing public uh, health system and ask nurses uh, in prenatal care clinics to you know, give the free bed nets to pregnant women or ask nurses in child care clinics to give these coupons for chlorine uh, to, to mothers who bring their child for a child wellness visit or something like that. Okay, so this is exactly the way it was actually done in these studies. Health workers were asked to do this, um, but because it was in the randomized control setting where we didn't want the provider of the, beha the behavior of the provider to, to affect um, our demand side study, we kept the health workers on a tight leash, okay? So there was no room for them to mess around. But in the real world, would they mess around? And so here, the issue is one of local capture versus local information. You would want to leave some discussion to the health workers to be able to identify whether somebody is indeed eligible or should be eligible for the, for the subsidy. Uh, but if you give them discretion, um, it, there is a risk of local capture, okay? Um, and there is r reasons to be concerned because in some other domains, there's been evidence of important rates of leakage. Uh, not all the money that's supposed to go to primary schools makes it to primary schools. Not all the rice that's supposed to go to households gets to households. There's also evidence, uh, anecdotal evidence, I should say, um, of extortion, so that's people, uh, health workers asking eligible patients to pay, uh, you know, to make side payments in order to get things that they are owed. Uh, and a, a third concern which has been very much studied is, is, studied is like shirking. So the mere fact that maybe the health workers are not there, and so, you know, you may have free bed nets in the storage room of the, of the clinic, but if the health workers are not there to open the storage room, uh, women are not gonna get these things, okay? So, I've looked at this in a study with Rebecca Dyson Ross and John Robinson, where uh, we audited, uh, you know, continuing on, on my uh, uh, bed net, uh, you know, uh, obsessions, uh, we looked at the effect of, I mean, we, sorry, we looked at the effectiveness of uh, setting up a, a free distribution of bed net scheme uh, through existing systems without this time, you know, uh, monitoring them officially. Um, and so we, we audited such a program in three countries. In Ghana, with 72 health centers, there was no government program there. So we set up one through an NGO, and then uh, we audited what, they, what was going on there. So the NGO is the one that told health workers at public clinics um, to do this and, and deliver the bed nets. Um, so Ghana is ranked 64th on the Transparency, Transparency International ranking uh, in terms of corruption. Uh, just for information, being number one is a good thing here. Um, so I think Denmark is number one. Uh, I don't remember who is number 178, but Ghana is 64. Uh, and then Kenya and Uganda, which are ranked much worse in terms of corruption, according to Transparency International. Um, there, the government was doing free distribution of bed nets at the time we started this study, okay? So we audited both these government-run programs and this NGO program in Ghana. And we look at leakage of nets to ineligibles. So for that, we sent spies, essentially, we, what we call mystery clients. Uh, we sent ineligible folks to the health centers, and they were you know, trying to get bed nets. So these are guys which, by definition, are not pregnant women, so they're not eligible for the study, and they tried to get one. And we asked them to recall whether they were asked to pay something, uh, if so, how much, whether they were able to get one, okay? And then we also look at coverage and extortion among eligible. So we do this uh, you know, random survey of, of uh, former clients of the antenatal care clinics and just check whether when they went for prenatal care, they did get offered a free benefit as they should have, okay? 
Um, and what do we find? We find very modest leakage to ineligibles. Um, so, you know, the likelihood that a mystery client was asked for a bribe was less than 5%. Uh, the likelihood that they got a bed net uh, was actually uh, just around um, uh, 2% in, in, in uh, Ghana. I don't have it on the slide, actually. 2% in Ghana and 9% uh, in uh, Kenya and 11% in Uganda. But in, Ga in Kenya and Uganda, it was all free. So they got them and they were for free. Um, they didn't have to pay. And if we ask a random person in the community whether they think uh, that a guy would be able to get a bed at the healthcare center, a uh, few of them think it would be the case, okay? And so um, one question is whether the few mystery clients who were able to get a bed net despite not being eligible um, got one because the healthcare workers were not doing a good job or whether it's because they were actually paying attention uh, to what these persons were saying. And so it's actually, is it leakage or is it efficient targeting? And we find that those mystery clients that were able to get uh, you know, get a bed net from these health workers, um, usually for free, were those that said, I have a child at home who is sick and I need one. If they said, I have a pregnant woman at home, they said, the health worker said, no, 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 bring your wife here. You know, she needs to get prenatal care, so I'm not giving you the bed net. Bring her. So that didn't work. But he said, I have a child who is really sick and, and I need a bed net. Then they were able to get, uh, to get it. So it's almost as if the health workers uh, were kind of like saying, well, the rule is a bit too strict because some households need one for their kids. Um, they, you know, they didn't get one when their wife was pregnant. Now that they need one for the kids, I'm going to give it to them. Now, obviously, it's cheap talks because we paid these guys to go around and claim they had sick children. So the health workers should not, you know, uh, be that gullible. But you can, you can see how maybe their intentions uh, in leaking the products are not that bad. Um, and then when we look at actually eligible recipients, we find relatively high rates of coverage. Uh, no extortion whatsoever if you are a pregnant woman and you go for prenatal care. Uh, with a great likelihood, you are offered a bed net. Uh, for free, you don't have to pay. We do have, you know, not everybody gets one. There is um, st stockouts is, is uh, quite important, especially in Uganda. So about 40% of women don't get one. Uh, it, there seems to be a little bit of uh, screening there as well, because we said the likelihood that you don't get one uh, is actually increasing um, with... Uh, with your years of education. In other words, the likelihood that you received a free one decreases with your years of education. So when the health workers seem to be about to run out, they start being a little bit more stringent in who they give it to. And if you look a bit too rich, maybe they don't give it to you. So again, they seem to be using their discretion in a way that uh, is possibly increasing the health impacts, uh, uh, or like minimizing the detrimental health impacts of running out, I should say. Um, so. This overall suggests you know, very little leakage and no extortion and high coverage. Uh, and so this is um, suggesting in our view, and especially the fact that we did this in three countries, uh, Kenya and you're going to have quite a bad reputation when it comes to, to corruption. Um, and so maybe this is because for a very simple, easy to verify targeting rule, and when there are obvious benefits to the beneficiaries, uh, it's actually quite costly for health workers to, to, not, do, to not do their job properly. And they uh, seem to be um, you know, quite uh, highly intrinsically motivated uh, to deliver these benefits to pregnant women. When we survey these health workers, they seem to be really caring about the community much more, for example, than teachers uh, in SM community seem to be caring about education. Okay, so there may be some positive selection of health workers uh, in these three countries that would explain their high uh, performance. So to, to conclude, um, uh, and then I'll take uh, questions. Um, you know, public subsidies are a substantial part of what developing governments do. Um, I've talked about health subsidies, but there are similar questions when it comes to subsidies for agricultural inputs, food distribution. This makes sometimes, you know, 10% of the national budget, sometimes even more. Um, the rationale for these subsidies is that they could have large effects on health and nutrition and things like that. Now, for these impacts to be there, a number of things need to hold. Subsidies must be targeted or assigned to those for whom the returns are highest. Leakage has to be limited and the beneficiaries of subsidized inputs uh, must put them to appropriate use. Um, and it seem, there seems to be cases where the targeting question uh, is obvious. We know that the returns to a given thing is higher for, let's say, pregnant women or young children, so many of the subsidies are targeted to specific gender or age groups. We found that uh, you know, the leakage seems to be a second order issue uh, for really essential health uh, products such as bed nets. Uh, and finally, on the last point, we find that uh, 
you know, beneficiaries do put things that they get for free to good use. Uh, and so price is quite too blunt of a tool uh, for targeting. Uh, when people are credit constrained and, and very poor, you get too many exclusion errors if you use price as a screening tool. Uh, although for some contexts, you get too many inclusion errors if you don't charge anything. And so that's where an ordeal can be possibly a good idea, but with all the caveats I mentioned, which is it's hard to get it right. Um, uh, so, you know, finally, I think all of this is, uh, you know, quite uh, now um, consistent with the fact that very recently people who have looked at the effect of massive increases in subsidies for malaria prevention through the Rollback Malaria Initiative have found substantial impacts uh, on child mortality going down uh, because indeed this seems to be an area where, um, you know, large public subsidies is, is a no-brainer. So that's, that's all I had. Thank you very much. <laughs>